So last lecture we learned a little bit about the basics of the theory of natural selection, uh, learned a little bit about evolution. We saw that natural selection has these very specific postulates and that it's not really based on randomness, it's based on selection, selective characteristics. Nature selects in natural selection, but humans select in artificial selection. But now we're going to apply what we learned about these basic understandings of, of adaptation and uh, evolution and talk a little bit about some specific behaviors related to motivation. So when we talk about behaviors that come to the world in the animal, inborn, already existed, determined by a great degree by genetics, and those genetics are shaped by evolution, we talk about instinct. Sometimes it's just the natural behaviors of the animal. An instinct is an inborn pattern of behavior that is characteristic of a species and is often a response to specific environmental stimuli. So we sometimes have very simple reflexes that animals have, shine a light into an animal's eye and their, their pupils constrict, they didn't need to come to the world learning to do that, place food in the mouth, they salivate. But some of these can be very complex behaviors. And we're going to talk about a few complex behaviors now. These are known as fixed action patterns. So instincts are what animals must do in some ways when related to um, external stimuli. But they don't have to learn this. There's no socialization. Animals do these behaviors primarily genetically determined. So what's a fixed action pattern? These are very specific patterns of behavior, some of them very complex, that an animal is born to do. They are induced by specific stimuli. We call those stimuli sign stimuli. A sign stimulus produces the fixed action pattern. Again, strongly genetically influenced. Doesn't mean it can't be shaped somewhat through experience. But very little or no learning takes place. Sometimes a fixed action pattern, if you look it up, sometimes they're called modeled action pattern. It depends on the book you're reading. Because people talk about modeled action pattern as because these behaviors aren't always necessarily purely fixed. So there's been some change in terms. Let me give you a few examples. So um, these are fish. They're stickleback fish and they get along just fine during the year and all of a sudden it becomes mating season and they begin to get red on their belly and when they get red on their belly the males they fight each other so simply presenting a stimulus that is round and red at the bottom will cause a stickleback fish to attack it to be aggressive okay so the sign stimulus is the red belly and the fixed action pattern is the aggression. Animals didn't learn, need to learn to do that, they'll just do it. Here's another example. Here is a seagull. And a seagull, if you look here, has a little red dot. Female has a little red dot on its beak. This red dot causes a fixed action pattern in the baby, in the little chick. The chick pecks it. And when this red dot is pecked, the bird regurgitates food. Okay, so they have a red dot. Chick pecks the red dot of its mother, and it regurgitates food. The chick didn't need to learn to do this through trial and error processing, through Pavlovian conditioning or instrumental conditioning. They come to the world ready to peck at red dots. In fact, they peck at anything red, and that is so that they will get the food. The stimulus is the red, the fixed action pattern is the pecking. One of my favorites is the example of the brood parasites. There's lots of different types of brood parasites. There are cowbirds and cuckoo birds, and here's what this bird does. The cowbird comes and lays its egg into another clutch of eggs of another species, and then she flies away, flies away. So the mama bird comes back, doesn't notice there's another egg there, and lays, you know, sits on the eggs, and the egg hatches. 
the cuckoo bird, or in this case the cow bird, um, hatches much more quickly than the other birds. It just comes to the world ready to do some very complex behaviors. And one of the complex behaviors that it does is it kicks the um, eggs out of the nest. So here's a nice uh, video of a cuckoo bird. See the baby pushing the other eggs out? Isn't that amazing? That's its butt right there. <laughs> That's a cuckoo bird pushing the other eggs out. And so now, there he is pushing it out. This is a fixed action pattern. It hatches, it automatically sees the eggs, it automatically scoots them out. It doesn't need to learn to do that. It does that so it doesn't have any competition. So that the, par the, the bird that it is parasiting, um, it will come and just feed that bird. Okay. Now the squeaking here, the opening of the mouth and the screaming also makes the animal, the mother, feed it, even though it's not its own species or its own young. That's a brood parasite. Really interesting stuff. How does it know to do that? What's in its brain? What genes produce these very complex behaviors? So what about humans? We have reflexes too. Now remember, you know, we come to the world with not a great deal of reflexes. It's one of our advantages. We are what's known as altricial animals. Altricial. It means we are very fragile. And we don't have a lot of complex ref reflexes. We don't have a lot of complex behaviors. And we're very fragile for a very long time. Which enables us as a species to learn a great deal during our lifetime, especially when we're young to adapt to our environment much more easily. And so it's a really our advantage. That said, we have to be taken care of. We're very fragile, okay? So we have to have somebody look after us until we're in our early to mid 20s, I think. Okay. So, one of the things that we do when baby is born is oftentimes we give them tests to look at these very simple reflexes. The Brazelton Neonatal Behavior Assessment Scale is one of those things. It looks for motor activities in babies. It checks reflexes, reactions to noises, reactions to faces. Does it cut? Does the little baby cuddle? Ring a little bell? Is there a startle reaction? These are just checking a lot, really, the nervous system, but it's looking at these reflexive behaviors. So here are some of the examples of things that are tested in, the, uh, in, in this neonatal test. I don't need you to know all of them, but let's look at just a few. Okay, there's the Moro reflex. This is just the baby's natural reflex, especially when it's kind of out in the open, lift them up, to naturally grab, okay, to, to put their arms out and grab things. It's known as the Moro reflex. The Babinski reflex, this is looking at whether the toes kind of um, uh, kind of flex and grab here by just drawing a little line on the toe. It's looking at the really a lot about the, uh, the, the baby's nervous system. The grabbing reflex, put the little finger in in the little baby's hand, they start to grab it. It's a natural reflex. But we have a lot of innate behaviors. They're just not very complex when you look at newborns. We cry, we smile, uh, we s suck on things, a little bit of biting. But there's some other ones that are also kind of complex, uh, especially young children. Imitation, anger, neophobia, scared of new things, xenophobia, fearful of new things, curiosity, love, shame, parental love. These come natural to us. They're genetically influenced. We don't see these in animals that just drop their young off. Like, like a turtle, a sea turtle drops off his eggs, her eggs and she leaves and the baby hatches. There's no socialization. So turtles don't have parental love, but a lot of animals like primates have those social connections, especially to their young and defending their young and all those kinds of things. So let's go back in history a little bit and look at somebody who thought about those instincts with a, with a little bit of well, a little bit of flair and a little bit of thought, looking at the unconscious and the preconscious and the the uh, id. And we get to Sigmund Freud. Now, 
I don't imagine there's a lot of discussion about Sigmund Freud in many modern-day psychology classes. Um, his approach was not really scientifically based. Um, not there wasn't the scientific method. There wasn't the empiricism. Doesn't mean he had a, not didn't have a lot of good things and interesting things to say about psychology at the time he was around and making his. Uh, judgments about psychology, while well, the scientific method as applied to psychology really wasn't that strong. It was more of philosophy. So let's, but we'll, we'll, we'll deal with him a little bit. You know, we oftentimes think of Sigmund Freud as, you know, these subconscious sexual desires, you know. So when you look at this picture, what do you see? Really? You get a dirty mind. Okay. So Freud talked about the conscious mind. Uh, this contains information we can uh, bring to a declarative state. Anything we can think about, thinking about my voice and the meaning of my lang my my words and my language, and uh, thinking about your car and and your house and all those things. Those are a conscious mind. Preconscious is really well. It, it contains memories and thoughts that you can access um, easily. I want you to right now think about your favorite place to get pizza if you eat pizza now you weren't thinking about that before that wasn't in your mind or maybe it was but probably wasn't but as soon as I said it you were able to bring up that idea of Domino's or Papa Murphy's or something like that but the unconscious is what Freud is probably best known for and what he's talking about here is our instincts our unconscious evolutionarily driven natural behaviors and maybe the conscious and the preconscious are dealing with that maybe this is part of the brain like the limbic system and the amygdala and deep down into the brain that is reacting to things like fear and hunger and sex um, and he thought that there was kind of a bit of a struggle between our conscious mind that deals with modern day rules and laws and ways of thinking and our unconscious mind that really has been driven by natural selection. They can, if we did everything that we desired, we wouldn't fit well in a modern society. But he also said the conscious mind is what we see, the preconscious is what we see, but the unconscious is where most things are stored, where most things inhabit your brain. And this is where we get into really Pavlovian learning and instrumental learning. And um, the, uh, the limbic system and some of those other things. And they fight each other. And we're going to talk about how maybe the conscious brain, the neocortex, and the old brain, the paleocortex, can sometimes fight with each other. Okay? So unconscious is censored by the preconscious and the and, and the conscious. But there's so much more impulses. Rep he talked about these as being repressed thoughts. They would come out in your dreams, they would come out in these sessions. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. But there's certainly a great deal of influence that we have and maybe an unconscious level that is driven by natural selection. So let's talk about some drives and some needs. We've talked about this a bit. Mechanisms refer to to how we do something, how we eat, how we get food, how we behave. Drives refer to what induces that behavior to happen, to do things. Um, you're going to go and make yourself a, a sandwich. Well, if you've just had a giant meal, you don't have that drive. When you have deprivation, you have the drive. Deprivation in many things. It could be food, or water, or it could be um, comfort, or even curiosity elicits those drives, motivating factors that start to find mechanisms for the behavior to ultimately reduce the drive. So we have needs, we have water needs. Hall called these tissue needs, waters and salts and sugars and potassium and all those things. And, he, and like I said, uh, Clark Hall called these uh, 
tissue needs, but we might also have secondary needs or psychological needs, emotional needs, mental needs, curiosity needs. Hull said that something is rewarding, something will elicit behavior, will maintain behavior, if it helps to reduce those drives, helps to reduce those needs. You have those needs, you're, you're very thirsty, the thirst creates the drive, anything that reduces the drive can be rewarding. So water to a thirsty animal, they'll learn to press levers to get water, they'll learn to press levers to get food if they're hungry. Here are a list of Murray's needs. Achievement, play, rejection, order. These are some complex psychological needs. Needs produce drive when their needs aren't met. Drive initiates behavior. Okay, so let's get into some attachment theory because we're still not done with Freud yet, I guess. How do primates attach to parents? We've already talked about the fact that turtles don't attach to their parents, except for in movies. But primates need to. A lot of mammals need to. Freud thought that we attach to our parents, animals attach to their parents, because their parents reduce primary drives. So the reason you attach to your mother is your mother provides you food. Um, and others said, well, I don't think that that is, the, I don't think it's primary drives, primary tissue needs where we get the attachment. So then we get into the work of Harry Harlow and his work with primates and monkeys. He said that it's more of secondary needs, comfort needs, emotional needs where we make our attachment. So he set up the very famous following experiment. Here's a little capuchin monkey. It's really sad stuff. The monkeys are taken away from their mother when they're born. So there's no socialization, but they have the need for attachment. They have a need, uh, innate instinct for comfort. I know it's the saddest thing. And Harlow gave them two monkeys. One monkey provide them f provided them food, the wire monkey, but it didn't provide any comfort. And the other monkey was soft and provided them comfort but no food. Freud said, Freud said that the animal would make an attachment to this and Harlow said this. And this is really where they made the attachment. In fact, there are pictures where this little monkey is holding on to the cloth monkey and drinking from, from the other monkey. Wire monkey provided food, terry cloth monkey provided comfort, attachment was for more secondary emotional psychological needs. What about play? Do animals need play? Do humans need play? There's been a lot of uh, interest uh, recently about the importance of play in mammals. There's also some evidence that when you look at people who are sociopaths, who commit violent crimes, who do not have empathy for others, you look back in their history and they didn't do a lot of play. There wasn't a lot of play in their childhood. And I remember reading this National Geographic article I really liked. It was all about animals at play. And they gave all these great examples of animals using sticks or balls or snow to play. And here's one of my favorite examples that came from that article. And so here is uh, a, a, a polar bear and a husky dog. And sometimes a husky, a sled dog, um, a polar bear might eat a sled dog. And they're always concerned about that. But this polar bear couldn't find other polar bears to play with. So the polar bear would come to the camp, would provide the husky with a symbol that it wanted to play, which is really sort of its butt up in the air, its shoulders down. It's not showing aggressive characteristics. The husky saw those behaviors and realized the animal just wanted to play. So they would come together every day for a couple weeks and they would play with each other. Here are two animals that weren't raised together that can be enemies at some time, but the polar bear needed play, the husky needed play, and so they wrestled. This gets to this fundamental question that is in every psychology course. Great debate, great philosophy about what influences behavior. 
Is it our natural selection? Is it our natural selection that produces genes? Is it genetically determined? Is it our nature that's genetically determined? Or is it our socialization? Is it the way we were raised? Is it our interaction and experiences that determine our behavior? That's the nurture. The nature versus nurture debate. It's been going on forever. So if we take the idea that we come to the world ready to learn, ready to be influenced, then we say our behavior is caused by nurture. This is known as an empiricist approach. John Locke was a philosopher that is probably best known for his tabula rasa, the idea we come to the world a blank slate ready to be written on by experience and that's who we are. Others take a nativist approach that a great deal of our behavior is determined by our genetics and our genetic influences on our nervous system. A person is born an alcoholic or born to be a criminal. Uh, it's who they are. It's their genetics. The nativist approach versus the empiricist approach. Well, I hope it's been clear by now, and if not, I'll make it clear. It's not really the way to look at it in terms of or. Nature versus nurture. Nature or nurture. They are intertwined. They influence each other. The genetics predispositions are played upon by our experiences. It's nature and nurture. But it doesn't mean that each of those don't have greater strength, greater weight in determining certain behaviors. There might One might be have, have a stronger influence. So let's take a couple of examples of what I mean by that. Huntington's disease is a neurological disorder. It is caused by a dominant allele, a dominant uh, a gene. You have two alleles for, uh, for a gene. You get one allele from mom, one allele from dad. And in Huntington's disease, if one of your parents has it, that means they have one of the alleles. And you have a 50-50 shot of getting it, assuming your other parent doesn't have it. It causes muscle twitches, um, it's sometimes called Huntington's chorea because the muscle twitch so much that it, a, a, a choreograph, chorea, dance. It's eventually fatal. And this dominant gene will produce these problems. It's really a replication of this dominant gene. And you can test for it now. You can get a test. It's a simple test to see if you have it. If one of your parents has it, you have a 50-50 chance of getting it. And there's not a lot you can do about it. You're going to develop this disease. It might be um, reduced a little bit by certain types of modern drugs, but your genes, if you have this, are going to produce it. Here's a question. If one of your parents had this, would you want to be tested? It doesn't really show up till the age of 25 or 30, but by age 40, you're probably not able to take care of yourself. So at age 20, would you want to know? Hmm, interesting. It has a strong natural component to it. Nature component because of the genes. What about depression? People can get depression, even chronic, severe depression that lasts a very long time. And that can be highly influenced by their experiences in life. We know that people with post-traumatic stress disorder oftentimes uh, get depression a lot more than the average. Uh, people with anxiety disorder can be caused by low levels of certain neurotransmitters such as serotonin and dopamine which are genetically determined. We see depression and chronic depression running in families. Uh, they have lower levels of these types of neurotransmitters called monoamines. The behavior brought about by this low level of serotonin can be gra greatly changed by drugs and therapy and experience. So it can be modified by experiences. It can be modified by modern drugs. It can be influenced by nurturing. So they go hand in hand. It might be said to have an equal nature-nurture component. People work on that, trying to understand that relative balance. What about human nature? 
We have a lot of common things that go on in human nature. These are shaped by natural selection, and they can be seen oftentimes across many cultures. If you ask somebody in Wisconsin to smile and, uh, and, and interact with a baby and, and try to make the baby laugh, they're going to do the same thing you're going to see in Nigeria, in, in, in China, these same kind of expressions. Actually, Darwin talked a lot about this, about uh, expressions being universal, strongly influenced by nature. So we talk about these universal motives, motives that we find in all cultures, or almost all cultures, you know, and having a great deal of, of genetic influence. They have genetic influences because cultures can be very, very different. Socialization and raising children can be quite different in one society or another, but we see these commonalities. So certain fears and food preferences and sexual attraction shaped by natural selection. Genes influence proteins. Proteins influence many things. Uh, muscles and glands and sen uh, sensory organs, immune systems, reflexes, respiration, and these all affect behavior. That's that pattern. So Malowinski talked about universal basic needs and their cultural responses. So on the left here, these are things we see in all cultures. In all, in, 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 I'm sorry, in everybody's, um, in all people. We see metabolism, the need for food. We see reproduction. We see the need for safety and comfort and movement. And over here is really a cultural response to this. Well, we have metabolism, so we have to grow food or produce food. We have reproduction needs, so we get kinship and marriage, and we have these culturally defined um, parts of our life that deal with these basic needs. Safety, so we create ro rules, laws, justice. In almost all culture, they have rules that help to to influence and affect safety. So this is how Malowinski looks at natural needs across cultures and the cultural responses. Well, here's a book that I read a long time ago. I really like it by Richard Dawkins. I was actually at uh, Oxford University where Richard Dawkins works, and it was kind of nice to be able to work with him a little bit. So what is the selective unit of natural selection? Um, it's not the population. That's not true. We'll see that. It might not even be the individual, which is really what Darwin talked about. The what is selected out is the individual. It might be the genes. It might be the genes that are the selective unit of natural selection. I'm going to give you some examples of this. Genes are passed from generation to generation. It's the thing that's consistent. If a gene is produces proteins that ultimately cause an adaptation in the animal, then that gene will be passed on because they will, on average, live longer and breed more. The gene, therefore, determines actions that facilitate the passing on of itself. So you have a gene for hunting or foraging or mate selection. If these are genes that work in that environment at that time, then they can get passed on. So let's look at the peacock, for example. Uh, here's a male peacock. He's got these giant feathers. And this isn't good for this individual. Okay, That's not good for that individual necessarily. Certainly not good for the population of peacocks. Why? Because the peacock has to give up a lot of energy, uh, produce a lot of time and energy in creating these big giant feathers. It also makes them bright. It makes them slow. It makes them easily caught by predators and they get eaten up. However, it does have an advantage. It passes on. Big, giant, bright, beautiful feathers, the genes that produce these get passed on. Why? Because it makes them attractive to mates. An animal that is dull doesn't mate. It might not get uh, it might not get eaten by a predator. It might be able to fly away really quickly over over maybe another member of its population if it's dull. 
but it's not going to pass on those genes because it won't be selected by the females. Let's look at some other things related to genes and behavior. Here's one example. There's a lot of these kinds of examples of genes influencing some complex behavior. Take the monoamine oxidase. This is an enzyme. Anything with the last letters ASC is an enzyme. And it helps to break up serotonin and dopamine, keep it from floating around the brain. Not everybody has uh, the gene, especially for one known as monoamine oxidase A. And it, people who don't have the gene for producing this enzyme, there's a correlation with those people and aggression. Low activity of this gene does not produce aggression, but can facilitate aggression if the individual is mistreated or encouraged to be aggressive. In other words, they're more aggressive when they're aggressive. Low levels of monoamine A may increase the propensity for aggression, may pro increase the propensity for um, violent crimes. This is a type of genetic determinism in a way, as opposed to free will. Determinism, people without this gene tend to, more than the other pop population that have these genes, tend to show more aggressive behavior. There's also what's known as super males. That's just a name given to them, but they're not super. These are individuals with extra Y chromosome. Normally a male is XY, these are XYY. And an extra Y chromosome can produce an increased levels in testosterone, can slightly decrease IQ. It's kind of rare, but while one in 2,000 of our population are XYY, 2% of the prison population are XYY. It doesn't mean that if you're XYY you go to prison. It doesn't have that perfect determinism. It just means that there is the greater likelihood that somebody who is XYY has an increased over average population for aggression and criminality. So there are about 10,000 XYY individuals in jail, but there are an additional 50,000 XYY not in jail. It's not an absolute determinism. It is just this kind of increased likelihood. Let's get into some complex stuff with good things with genes. So let's take on the idea of altruism, altruism. This is the practice of putting others' needs before your own, self-sacrificing almost to your detriment. You help others and you are um, hurt by that action in some way. So why would an animal be self-sacrificing? Why would it sacrifice itself for others? What if there's a gene for altruism? This gene makes an animal uh, die to save other members of its, of its clan. Why would that gene continue in the population? Wouldn't that animal live less long? Wouldn't that animal breed less often? Wouldn't nature select that gene for altruism to be removed? So, but there are many examples of altruism in many animals, including humans. Squirrels and meerkats and monkeys oftentimes warn of danger of eagles or of uh, or predators or lions. If you're squeaking and yelling and warning others, you draw attention to yourself and you increase the probability you're going to get eaten. Other animals are what are known as reproductive altruists. They give up their ability to reproduce. They don't reproduce at all. Honeybees, termites, many of them, the worker, the worker females, don't reproduce. The queen reproduces. So why would they have that behavior to just forego all reproduction? Even naked mole rats, which is a mammal, some of them give up their reproduction, reproductive rights and help others. So if the above behaviors are caused by genes, and here's the little meerkat warning others and then gets swept up by an eagle, why do they pass on those genes? How do those genes get passed on? You have a gene that produces, that makes you warn it, warn others, that makes you more vulnerable to die. 
how can that gene be passed on? How can that gene be in high frequency in a population? So we get at the notion of what's called kin selection. Kin selection is the idea that these animals that give up their reproductive right or increase the likelihood that they'll die by their action might be able to pass on their genes anyway. Even if this squirrel never reproduces, it still passes on its genes. Let's think about how. What we get into is what's known as inclusive fitness. Fitness of the individual to pass on its genes through reproduction. Fitness obtained by reproduction of its relatives. So you share genes with your relatives. If you have an altruistic gene, they have that altruistic gene. You sacrifice yourself, but you save others. The others do better because of you. Then they pass on their genes better. An individual can pass on more of its genes by saving many of its relatives that it shares its genes with. So how many, sh how many genes do you share with your relatives? If you have a brother or sister, you have 50% of your genes you share with them. So if you're a squirrel and you're living in a community and you warn others of this lion coming through and eating a whole bunch of squirrels and you die, or a meerkat I guess would be a lion, and you die, but maybe you save a lot of your brothers and sisters. You share 50% of your genes with them. If you have the gene for altruism, you can pass that on through your brothers and sisters. You share 25% with your grandparents and grandchildren, 12.5% with first cousins, and all you have to do is the math. So this was put together by a guy named Hamilton. He discussed ways in which an individual can act to help others and pass on their genes. We get into what's known as Hamilton's rule. When should genes promote altruism? Hamilton said it's simply a cost-benefit relationship. Taking into account the level of the relationship that the people of the animals you're saving and the cost to you of helping them in terms of your fitness. This is genetically or innately determined, not a conscious determination. The, the squirrel isn't sitting there going, well, let's see, here comes an eagle. And uh, let's see, if I warn my brothers, I have one, two brothers, sisters, if I warn them, then I'll pass on my genes. It's nothing. It's innate. Okay? So this is Hamilton's rule. To be altruistic, if, be altruistic, if the benefit to you genetically, how, much, how many genes you pass on, divided by the cost, is larger than the reciprocal of the relationship you have with the people you save or the other squirrels you save, or the other meerkats you save, or the other honeybees that you're allowing to thrive in the hive. The coefficient of the kinship between the altruists and the receiver of the altruism. So it doesn't, you don't see altruism in sea turtles because ultimately they probably don't have close relationships with the other sea turtles around them. But in animals that live in strong social groups, like squirrels and meerkats and primates and many birds, they have a greater likelihood that they're saving some other member of the species, member of the population that share their genes. The cost is in Darwinian fit fitness, likelihood, likelihood of you um, being eaten or being killed or lost, and the benefit the benefit, how much likely, what's the likelihood you're going to save somebody else? And when you get into reproductive altruists, they don't share 50%. A female honeybee does not share 50% of her genes with a queen. She shares 75% of her genes. So take care of the hive, bring in the food, protect the hive, and you're passing on 75% of your genes by doing that. If you'd like to read more, I left a, a website down here that you can go to and you can read more about Hamilton's rule. So, comes down to this. Here's another biologist, very famous biologist. He said, I would lay down my life 
for two brothers or eight cousins. That's how you get altruism. We get into questions like this, a philosophy of the nature of human beings. Are we selfish? Are we helpful? Are we good? Are we evil? Well, we're probably all those things. But we aren't naturally selfish. We aren't necessarily selfish. We aren't naturally evil. We are naturally cooperative. We are naturally altruistic because we evolved in social communities. All right.